July oration, but better known by its primary question, what to the slave is the 4th of July? Born in 1818 on a Talbot County plantation, Mr. Douglas was sent to Baltimore at the age of seven. While enslaved to the, fa the family of Henry Ault, Douglas learned to read first from the ministrations of Mrs. Ault, and then more secretively after her husband forbade it. He copied passages from the Bible on a nightly basis and learned to provoke local school children into reading competitions in order to learn additional words. Mr. Douglas credits his successful escape in part to his ability to read and his resultant understanding of Christianity. In September 1838, Douglas took his freedom, escaping Baltimore via train and steamboat and ultimately settling in Massachusetts with his wife, Anna Douglas. In 1841, Douglas gave a speech to the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society and thereafter used his oratory skill to campaign successfully for human rights. On July 5, 1852, Douglas delivered Fourth of July oration at the Rochester's Ladies Anti-Slavery Society. His story is local and his words remain pertinent. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Douglas. Thank you. citizens, he who could address this audience without a quailing sensation has stronger nerves than I have. I do not remember ever having appeared as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. The task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. I know that apologies of this sort are generally considered flat and unmeaning. I trust, however, that mine will not be so misunderstood. Should I seem at ease, my appearance would much misrepresent me. The little experience I've had in addressing public meetings in country schoolhouses avails me nothing on the present occasion. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable and the difficulties to be overcome in getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude. You will not therefore be surprised if, if in what I have to say I evince no elaborate preparation, nor grace my speech with any high sounding exordium. With little experience and with less learning, I have been able to throw my thoughts hastily and imperfectly together, and trusting to your patient and generous indulgence, I will receive and lay them before you. This, for the purpose of this celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This, to you, is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance and to the signs and to the wonders associated with that act and that day. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life. It reminds you that the Republic of America is now 243 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. Three score years and ten is an allotted time for individual men, but nations number their years by thousands. According to this fact, you are even now only in the beginning of your national career, still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the horizon. The eye of the reformers met with angry flashes portending disastrous times. But his heart may well beat lighter at the thought that America is young, and that she is still in the impressive stage of her existence. May he not hope that the high lessons of wisdom, of justice, of truth, will yet give direction to her destiny. Were the nation older, the patriot's heart might be saddened, and the reformers' brow heavier. Its future might be shrouded in gloom, and the hope of its prophets go out in sorrow. There is consolation in the thought that America is young. Great streams are not easily turned from channels and worn deep with the course of ages. They may sometimes rise in quiet and stately majesty and inundate the land, refreshing and fertilizing the earth with their mysterious properties. They also may rise in wrath and fury, 
and bear away on their angry waves the accumulated wealth of years of toil and hardship. They, however, gradually flow back into the same old channel and flow on as serenely as ever. But the river may not be turned aside. It may dry up and leave nothing behind but the withered branch and the unsightly rock to howl in the abyss sweeping wind the sad tale of departing glory. As with rivers, so with nations. Feeling themselves harshly and unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous and respectful and loyal manner. Their conduct was wholly unexceptionable. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn. Yet they persevered. They were not the men to look back. As the sheet anchor takes firmer hold when the ship is tossed by the storm, so did the cause of your forefathers grow stronger as it breasted the chilling glass of kingly displeasure. The greatest and best of British statesmen admitted its justice, and the loftiest eloquence of the British Senate came to its support. But when that blindness, which seems to be unvarying characteristics of tyrants, since Pharaoh and his hosts were drowned in the Red Sea, the British government persisted in the exactions complained of. The madness of this course, I believe, is admitted now even by England. But we fear the lesson is wholly lost on our present ruler. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your forefathers were wise men, and if they did not go mad, they became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling idea, much more so than we, at this distance in time regarded. The timid and prudent of that day were, of course, shocked and alarmed by it. Such people lived then, had lived before, and will probably ever have a place on this planet. And their course in respect to any great change, no matter how great the good to be attained, or the wrong to be redressed by it, may be calculated as, with as much precision as can be the course of the stars. They hate all changes, but silver, gold, and copper. Of this sort of change, they are always strongly in favor. <laughs> their opposition to the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful. But amid all their terror and affrighted vociferations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on in the country. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshippers of property, clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national sanction. They did so in the form of resolution. And as we seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day, whose transparency is at all equal to this, it may refresh your minds and help my story if I read it. Resolved that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Citizens, your forefathers made good on that resolution. They succeeded, and today you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you therefore may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history, the very ring bolt in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the ring bolt to the chain of your nation's destiny. So indeed I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving and saving principles. Stand by those principles, be true to them on all occasions, in all places, and against all foes, at whatever cost. I remember also that as a people, Americans are remarkably familiar with all facts which make them their own favor. This is esteemed by some as a national trait, perhaps a national weakness. It is a fact that whatever makes for the wealth and for the reputation of Americans, and can be had cheap, will be found by Americans. I shall not be charged with slandering Americans if I say I think the American side of any question may be left safely in American hands. I leave, therefore, the great deeds of your forefathers to other people who claim, whose claim has been more regularly descended will be less likely to speak of than mine. My business, if I have any here today, is with the present. The accepted time with God and his cause is the ever-living now. We relate to the past only as we can make it useful to the present. 
and to the future. To all inspiring motives, to noble deeds, which can be gained from the past, we are welcome. But now is the time, the important time. Your fathers have lived, died, and done their work, and have done much of it well. You live and must die, and you must do your work. You have no right to enjoy a child's share of the labors of your fathers unless your children are to be blessed by your workers. You have no right to wear out and waste the hard-earned fame of your fathers to cover your ignorance. Sidney Smith tells us that men seldom eulogize the wisdom and virtues of their fathers unless to excuse some folly or wickedness of their own. This truth is not a doubtful one. There are illustrations of it near and remote, ancient and modern. It was fashionable hundreds of years ago for the children of Jacob to boast, we have Abraham to our father, when they had long lost Abraham's faith and spirit. The people that contended themselves under the shadow of Abraham's great name while they repudiated the deeds which made his name great. Need I remind you that a similar thing is being done all over this country today. Washington could not die till he had broken the chains of his slaves, yet his monument is built up by the price of human blood, and the traitors and the bodies and souls of men shout, We have Washington as our father. A shame that it should be so, yet so it is. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask why I am called to speak here today. What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national interest? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? I wish to God, for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to these questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. For who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm? Who so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such priceless benefits? But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. The 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and call upon him to join you in joyous anthems is in human mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you mean citizens to mock me by asking me to speak this day? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct, and let me warn you that it is a dangerous to copy the example of a nation whose crimes, lowering up to heaven, were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, burying that nation in irrecoverable horror. I can today take up the plaintive lament of appealed and woe spent people. Fellow citizens, above your national and tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. I do forget if I do not faithfully I do not do forget if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with a popular theme would be treason, most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. My subject, then, fellow citizens, is American slavery. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. Standing there, identified with the American bondman, making his wrongs mine, I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never looked blacker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we turn to the equally hideous and revolting, America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, dare to call in question and to denounce with all emphasis I can command everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. 
I will not equivocate, I will not excuse, I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice, or is not at heart a slaveholder, shall not confess to be right and just. But I fancy I hear someone of my audience say, it is just in this circumstance that you and your brother abolitionists failed to make a favorable impression on the public. Would you argue more and denounce less? Would you persuade more and rebuke less? Your cause would be much more likely to succeed. But I submit, for all this plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do people of this country need light? Must I undertake to prove the slave is a man? That point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on part of the slave. There are 72 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of the same crimes will subject a white man to the like punishment. What is this but acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, responsible being? For the present, it is enough to affirm the manhood of the Negro race. It is not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, Using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in the metals, brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold. That while we are reading and writing and ciphering, acting as clerks, merchants, and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers. That while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to other men, worshiping the Christian's God, and looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, that we are called to prove upon. Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body? You've already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a doubtful application of the principle of justice hard to be understood? How should I look today in the presence of Americans Dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have natural right to freedom. Speaking of relatively and positively, negatively and affirmatively, to do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. What am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes? to rob them of liberty, to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with a lash, to load their limbs with iron, to hunt them with dogs, to sell them at auctions, to sunder their families, to knock out their teeth, to burn their flesh, to starve them into obedience and submission to their masters. Must I argue that a system thus marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No, I will not. I have better employments for my time and strength than such arguments for at a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability, could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of fighting ridicule, blasting reproach, and withering sarcasm and stern review. For it is not light that is needed, but fire. It is not the gentle shower, but fire. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The feeling of the nation must be quick in the conscience of the nation, must be roused, the propriety of the nation must be startled, the hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed, and its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What to the American slave is the 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boast of liberty and unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality felt, felt hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. A thin veil to cover up the crimes which have disgraced a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody and are the people of these United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of old world, travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, 
Lay your facts by the side of every day practices in this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without right. Take the American slave trade, which we are told by the papers is especially prosperous just now. <coughs> they tell us the price of men was never higher than now. They mention the fact to show that slavery is in no danger. The trade is one of the peculiarities of American institutions. It is carried on in the large towns and cities in one half of this confederacy, and millions are pocketed every year by dealers in this horrid traffic. The several states this, in several states, this trade is a chief source of wealth. It is called, in contrast to the foreign slave trade, the internal slave trade. It is probably called so, too, in order to divert from the horror with which the foreign slave trade is contemplated. That trade has long since been denounced by this government as piracy. It has been denounced with burning words from high places of the nation as an execrable offense. To arrest it, to put it to an end, the nation keeps a squadron at, at immense cost on the coast of Africa. Everywhere in this country it is safe to speak of this foreign slave trade as a most inhuman trap, opposed alike to the laws of God and man. The duty to extirpate and destroy it is admitted even by our doctors of divinity. In order to put an end to it, some of these last have consented that their colored brethren nominally free should leave this country and establish themselves on the western coast of Africa. It is, however, a notable fact that while so much an execration is poured out by Americans upon those engaged in the foreign slave trade, the men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation, and their business is deemed honorable. Behold the practical operation of the internal slave trade, the American slave trade, sustained by American politics and American religion. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. You know what is a swine drover? I will show you a man drover. They inhabit all our southern states. They perambulate the country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. You will see one of these human flesh droppers armed with a pistol, whip, and bowie knife, driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave markets in New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold singly or in lots to suit purchasers. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along, and the inhuman wretch who drops them. Hear his savage yell and his blood-chilling oaths as he hurries on his affrighted captives. There, see the old man with locks standing gray. Cast one glance, if you please, upon that young mother whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun, her briny tears falling on the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, that girl of thirteen weeping, yes, weeping, as she thinks of the mother for whom she has been torn. The drove moves tardily. Heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strength, and suddenly you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle. The fetters clank, the chain rattles simultaneously, your ears are saluted with a scream that seems to have torn its way to the center of your soul. The crack you heard was the sound of the slave whip. The scream you heard was from the woman you saw as a baby. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child and her chains, and that gash on her shoulders tells her to move on. Follow the drove to New Orleans. Attend the auction, see men examined like horses, see the form of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this drove soul and separate it forever and never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from that scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where, under the sun, you can witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking. Yet this is what a glance of the American slave traders exists at this moment in the ruling part of the United States. I was born amid such sights and scenes. To me, the American slave trade is a terrible reality. When a child, my soul was often pierced with a sense of its horrors. I lived on Philpott Street, Fells Point, Baltimore, and have watched from the wharves, the slave ships in the basin, anchored from the shore with their cargoes of human flesh, waiting for favorable winds to walk them down the Chesapeake. There was, at that time, a grand slave mark kept at the head of Pratt Street, Boston Wolf. His agents were sent into every town and county in Maryland, announcing their arrival through papers and on flaming handbills headed, Cash for Negroes. These men were generally well-dressed men and very captivating in their manners, ever ready to drink and to gamble. The fate of many a slave is dependent upon the turn of a single card, and many a child has been snatched from the arms of its mother by bargains arranged in a state of brutal drunkenness. In the deep darkness of midnight, 
I have often been aroused by the dead, heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chain gangs that pass our door. The anguish of my boyish heart was intense, and I was often consoled when speaking to my mistress in the morning to hear her say that the custom was very wicked, that she hated to hear the rattle of chains and the heart pitting cries. I was glad to find one who sympathized with me in my horror. Fellow citizens, this murderous traffic is today in active operation in this posted republic. In the solitude of my spirit, I see the clouds of dust raised on the highways of the south. I see the bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets, where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep, and swine knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest ties ruthlessly broken to gratify the lust, caprice, and rapacity of the buyers and sellers of men. My soul sickens at the sight. But still more inhuman, great disgraceful, and scandalous state of things remains to be presented. By an act of American Congress not yet two years old, slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form. By that act, Mason and Dixon's line has been obliterated. New York has become as Virginia, and the power to hold, hunt, and sell men, women, and children as slaves remains no longer a mere state institution, but is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is coextensive with the Star Spangled Banner in American Christianity. Where these go, may also go the merciless slavery. Where these are, man is not sacred. He is a bird for the sportsman's go. In glaring violation of justice and shameless disregard for the forms of administering law, in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenseless, and in diabolical intent, the fugitive slave law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. I doubt if there be another nation on the globe having the brass and basis to put such a law on the statute. If any man in this assembly thinks differently from me on this matter and feels able to disprove my statement, I will gladly confront him at any suitable time and place he may select. I take this law to be one of the grossest infringements of Christian liberty. And if the churches and ministers of our country were not stupidly blind and most wickedly indifferent, they too would so regard it. At this very moment, they are thanking God for the enjoyment and civil religious liberty and for the right to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. They are utterly silent in respect to a law which robs religion of its chief significance and makes it utterly worthless to a world violent violence. A worship that can be conducted by persons who refuse to give shelter to the houseless, to give bread to the hungry, clothing to the naked, who enjoin obedience to a law forbidding these acts of mercy, is a curse not a blessing to mankind. The Bible addresses all such persons as scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, who be tithe of mint, anise, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier goals of the law, judgment, mercy, and pain. But the church of this country is not only indifferent to the wrongs of the slave, it actually takes sides with the oppressors. It has made itself the bulwark of American slavery, and the shield of American slave hunters Many of its most eloquent divines who stand in the very light of the church have shamelessly given sanction of religion in the Bible to the whole slave system. They have, or, they have taught that man may properly be a slave and that relation of master to slave is ordained of God. That to send back an escape bondman to his master is clearly the duty of the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this horrible blasphemy is palmed up upon the world as Christianity. For my part, I would say welcome infidelity. Welcome atheism. Welcome anything in preference to the gospel as preached by those divines. They convert the very name of religion into an engine of tyranny and barbarous cruelty, and serve to confirm more infidels in this age than all infidel writings of Thomas Paine, Voltaire, Bowen, put together have done. They strip the love of God of its beauty, and leave the throng of religion as a huge, horrible, repulsive form. It is religion for oppressors, tyrants, man-stealers, and thugs. It is not the pure and undefiled religion, which is from above, which is first pure, then peaceable, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. But a religion which favors the rich against the poor, which exalts the proud above the humble, which divides mankind into two classes, tyrants and slaves, which says to the man in chains, stay there, and the oppressor, oppress on. They are a trouble to me. I am weary to bear them, and when you spread your arm, your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Cause to do evil, learn to do well. 
seek judgment, relieve the oppressed, judge for the fatherless, plead for the widow. The American church is guilty when viewed in connection with what it is doing to uphold slavery. But it is superlatively guilty when viewed in connection with its ability to abolish slavery. Let the religious press, the pulpit, the Sunday school, the conference meeting, the great ecclesiastical missionary, Bible and tract associations of the land array their immense powers against slavery and slaveholding, and the whole system of crime and blood will be scattered to the wind. <coughs> and that they do not do this involves them in the most awful responsibility of which the mind can conceive. <coughs> in prosecuting the anti-slavery enterprise, we have been asked to spare the church, to spare the ministry, but how, we ask, can such a thing be done? We are met on the threshold of our efforts for the redemption of the slave by the church and ministry of the country in a battle array against us, and we are compelled to fight or flee. From what quarter, I beg to know, has preceded a fire so deadly upon our ranks during the last few years as from the pulpit? My spirit wearies of such blasphemy, and how such men can be supported as the standing types and representatives of Jesus Christ is the mystery which I leave others to penetrate. In speaking of the American church, however, let it be distinctly understood that I mean the great mass of religious organizations in our land. One is struck with the difference between the attitude of the American church towards the anti-slavery movement and that of occupied churches by, occupied by the churches in England towards a similar movement in that country. The anti-slavery movement there was not an anti-church movement because the church took its full share in prosecuting that movement. And the anti-slavery movement in this country will cease to be an anti-church movement when the church of this country shall assume, assume a favorable instead of hostile position towards that movement. Americans, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly inconsistent. You glory in your refinement, your universal education, yet you maintain a system as barbarous and dreadful as ever stained the character of a nation. A system begun in avarice, supported in pride, and perpetuated. You are all on fire at the mention of liberty for France and for Ireland, but are as cold as an iceberg at the thought of liberty for the enslaved of America. Your discourse, eloquent love, and dignity of labor, yet you sustain a system which in its very essence casts a stigma upon labor. You can bear your bosom to the storm of British artillery, which in its you can bear your storm to the bosom of British artillery to throw off a three penny tax on tea, and yet wring the last hard earned farthing from the grasp of the black laborers of your you profess to believe that of one blood God made all nations of men to dwell on the face of earth, and hath commanded all men everywhere to love one another. Yet you notoriously hate, and glory in your hatred, all men whose skins are not colored like your own. You declare before the world, and are understood by the world, to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among those rights, our life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet, you hold securely in bondage, which according to your own Thomas Jefferson, is worse than the ages of that which your fathers rose to rebellion to oppose, a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism a sham, your humanity is based pretense, and your Christianity is a lie. It destroys the moral power abroad, that it corrupts your politicians at home. It saps the foundation of religion. It makes your name a hissing and a byword to a mocking earth. It is the antagonistic force in your government, the only thing that seriously disturbs and endangers your union. It fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement, the deadly foe of education. It fosters pride. It breeds insolence. It promotes vice, it shelters crime, it is a curse to the earth that supports it, and yet you cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. Oh, be warned. Be warned. The horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster, and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy it forever. But it is answered in a reply to all of this that precisely what I have now denounced is in fact guaranteed and sanctioned by the Constitution of the United States. That the right to hold and to hunt slaves is a part of the Constitution framed by the illustrious fathers of this republic. Then I dare to affirm, notwithstanding all I have said about your fathers before, basically, 
And instead of being honest men, I have before declared them to be. They were the veriest impostors that have ever practiced on mankind. This is the inevitable conclusion. And from it, there is no escape. But I differ from those who charge this based on some frames of the Constitution of the United States. It is a slander upon their memory, at least so I believe. There is not a time now to argue the constitutional question at length, nor have I the ability to discuss it as it ought to be discussed. But in that document, I hold there is neither warrant, license, nor sanction of the hateful thing, but interpreted as it ought to be interpreted. The Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Read its preamble. Consider its purposes. Is slavery among them? Is it at the gateway? Or is it in the temple? It is not. While well, I do not intend to argue this question on the present occasion, let me ask if it be not somewhat singular that the Constitution were intended by its framers and adopters a slaveholding instrument. Why neither slavery, slaveholding, nor slave can be found anywhere in it? What would be the thought of a document drawn up, legally drawn up, for the purpose of entitling the city of Rochester to a tract of land in which no mention of land was made. Now there are certain rules of interpretation for the proper understanding of all legal instruments. These rules are well established. They are plain, common sense rules such as you and I and all of us can understand and apply without having passed years of the study of law. Now take the Constitution according to its plain reading, and I defy the presentation of a single pro-slavery cause in it. On the other hand, it will be found to contain principles and purposes entirely hostile to the existence of slavery. I have detained my audience entirely too long already. At some future period, I will gladly avail myself of an opportunity to give this subject a full and fair discussion. Allow me to say, in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture that I have this day presented of the state of this nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work for the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened, and the doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began, with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time has passed when such could be done. Long established customs of hurtful character could formally fence themselves in and do their evil work with social impunity. Knowledge was then confined and enjoyed by the privileged few, and the multitude walked out in mental darkness. But a change has come now over the affairs of mankind. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathway over and under the sea, as well as on the earth. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on the other. The far off and almost fabulous Pacific rolls in grand air. The celestial empire, the mystery of ages is being solved. The fiat of the arm almighty. Let there be light has not yet spent its force. No abuse, no outrage, whether in taste, sport, or avarice, can now hide itself in the all-pervading light. In the fervent aspirations of William Lord Garrison, I say, God speed the year of Jubilee, the wide world over, when from their galling chains set free, the oppressed shall vilely bend the knee. Until that year, day, hour arrive, with head and heart and hand I'll strive, to break the rod and rend the God, the spoiler of his prey to pride. So witness heaven, and never from my chosen post, whatever the peril or the cost, be driven. Thank you.
It's, 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 I thought about it. Um, but my name is Joel Cook. I'm a graduate student at East Carolina University. I'm studying in the Maritime Studies program, but I kind of do this on the side. I'm really into this sort of interpretation. Um, so I appreciate you all coming today to see this. This is my first time ever performing this. I was a little bit terrified. <laughs> but um, I, I felt like it went well, and I appreciate you all coming out to see it. What year did you give this speech? It was 1852. Yeah, so we can start questioning and answering out job questions, by the way. So yeah, the speech was given in 1852. Um, and at that point, he was, you know, not far removed from being an enslaved himself. And he, had, the reason, you know, when he starts in the beginning, and he says, "Oh, you know, I apologize for not, um, you know, not being comfortable in this environment and not giving a speech." He was really, genuinely terrified. Just like you were. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, living history. <laughs> so, but he thought about his life, what what his life was going to be, right after the speech, you know, for the perjury. <coughs> Say that one more time. Yeah, he was probably up in the fear for his life. Oh yeah, absolutely. 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 Yeah. So there's there's the fear of you know having never been in that environment, and then, uh, then there's the fear of I'm not going to make that idea. Still technically a fugitive slave. Uh, there's still somebody out here looking for me, mm -hmm. and now I'm in this big environment giving this big speech where everybody's going to know I'm here. Who was the so audience? The audience uh, at the time was. Uh, I'm fairly confident the president was there. Uh, and then uh, he had just a, a scattered array of like wealthy aristocrats and whatnot from uh, the New York area. Um, so yeah, it was, it was legit. Uh, and then he had the idea of having to give that speech to that audience while also being a fugitive slave at the same time. Um, so somebody yeah. following him and getting yeah. him in. Yeah, you, know, you gotta think about it that way. If, if, if you're a slave catcher and you're like, oh, I caught Frederick Douglass, everybody's gonna hire me. So people are going to be like, oh yeah, well, I'm going to hire that guy. Yes, ma'am. Do you think the audience was expecting anything close to what he said, or did they think that it was going to be this nice speech by Frederick Douglass celebrating the 4th of July? And from, from what I understood, it was a surprise. So there were some people in the audience that kind of knew him, and they're like, "Oh, this is gonna be good." <laughs> so he pretty much but, trashed all the, all the. I mean, he pretty much trashed all the institutions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, he went for the jugular for sure. It, is there is there any um, knowledge about what the reaction was? Did people get up and leave? Did people boo? I honestly don't know, but I know that after that, this was a speech that really, truly started his career. Um, so I feel like the reaction was probably shock, but acceptance at the same time. I mean, they knew what he was saying wasn't wrong. You know, if you're being realistic about it, it's, it's, it's a fair statement to make. So I think that, you know, considering the person that's speaking, because at this time they're thinking, you know, this is just some formerly escaped black guy who can't read. You know, they don't know much about him. Uh, so he comes in and gives this, this eloquent, powerful speech. Um, and I remember distinctly people, people saying that like you could hear a pin drop when he was speaking in there. Um, and then you could hear like people were kind of silently crying while he was talking to him. So I, I don't think the reaction was negative. There's going to be a, you know, a negative reaction from some people. But for the most part, I think it was really well received. And there were not yet abolitionists in the room, yeah, mostly, there were, so there were people who agreed with him. To absolutely. Him. There were a lot, there were a lot of abolitionists in the room. They must have realized by then that the so-called independence and freedom was only for white male landowners. Right. So that was it. Right. Was it published in the paper? I don't think so. Because uh, it was, I think the speech is very cut down, what I, what I delivered here today. The speech, when you time it, uh, the full length of the speech, it was over two hours long. So when you publish that in the paper, you're, that is the paper. <laughs> yeah, a question back here? Yeah, um, aside from memorizing the speech itself, how did you prepare? What did, what did you look at? How did you, what, what did you look at as far as Frederick Douglass' life? How did you prepare for the role? I walked around in my apartment in the suit a lot. <laughs> um, and I read, I read a lot of uh, 
his personal writings. He's got three autobiographies. Um, there's also a book called The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass that was written in 1891, which he would have been around to give input on that book. So I use that as a really important source. And then I have, you know, I have a really strong network of uh, friends in the historical community that I reached out to and was like, hey, if I'm a tidbit, send it to me. If you find this, you know, let me know. Um, there's, a, there's an author named Cody Eish um, who does some excellent research on Frederick Douglass, and I, I lean on him a lot. Um, like higher-wise, uh, do you have to look for something in this period or something that, based upon the pictures that uh, that uh, of like Frederick Douglass, that what he was wearing, things like that, to be more? I based it on a picture from uh, 1855, so it would have been three years or so after the speech, and I figured his facial hair would be similar and all that. Um, but in that picture, he's actually he's wearing a darker uh, or coat, but he would have varied over time. Of course. Um, so style wise. Style wise, this is about, this is what he would have looked like in that period, the 1850s. While he was in Rochester at that time, um, do you know if he met with some of the suffragettes? I'm pretty sure he did. Um, because he was really heavily involved in the um, women's suffrage movement post Civil War. Um, so I'm pretty sure he was making those connections at that point. If I'm not mistaken, the speech was given on the 5th. Was that done deliberately? That he didn't want to perform the speech on the 4th, or would it be a bit for the 5th? I think it was just the timing. Um, it was just delivered on the 5th because, you know, think about it, everybody celebrating on the 4th, and then they got to wind down a little bit on the 5th and come in and have this conversation. I like questions. I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Are you excited to be able to cut your hair again? I think we're going to break it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed, um, you know, whenever I was uh, working my way through it, um, it's like I'm reading the news and then I'm working on the speech and I'm like, yeah. I'm really looking at something different. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, felt, it felt really mm -hmm. uh, poignant, especially when he talked about the fugitive slave laws. Because it doesn't feel different than what you're looking at with a lot of the immigration policy today. Mm -hmm. um, and you start mm -hmm. looking at it and go, well, after all this time, how far have we actually right. traveled? Exactly. <clears throat> That's why I felt like it was really important to, to give the speech and have this conversation because, you know, we're it's talking about hypocrisy of churches right. and religion. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so the mm -hmm. same all over. Right. And then at the same time, there's still that optimism. You know, because you've got mm -hmm. people, we're, we're all obviously aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, we're all obviously doing something to make a difference. So there's still, like you said, you know, there's still that optimism <coughs> about it. There's still people out there that want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so you should start with all of them that. Yeah. Giving all the education. <laughs> and so we still stay dumb enough to believe in in religion like that. Um then I believe in Jesus Christ and always will. So you you can do great works in Christ. Christ. I think everybody, you know, everybody kinda has like have your own sites. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So will you be giving this speech you elsewhere anytime soon? I sure hope so. Um, <laughs> you know, I I might like be all over the place. Yeah, I'd like Seriously. to continue uh, uh, going out and performing and giving really more than just this talk. I'd like to do a couple of these different uh, speeches because they're all relevant. So, yeah. One more question. So, Joel, would you being Frederick Douglass right now, given this speech, what is your charge to people once they hear this speech? What do you want people to walk away with, given that the things that are said in this speech are so relevant? Do something. <laughs> you know, um, you, you know what's happening. Know that there are opportunities for you to do something about it. So go do something. I think that's that's what he would have said. Um, and that was the reason he gave the speech is to say, hey, like, wake up. You know, we, we have an opportunity right now to go out and, and be in this community and be out in the world and do something different than what we're doing right now. 
Because we can't, you know, stand here today and say, oh, well, you know, this is the 4th of July, everyone's free, when we know everyone's not free. Oh, well, great. You know, so, we'll do something. That's what you're trying to decide, you know, who will be the change. Yes, ma'am? I love the fact that he ends uh, on a note of hope. Mm -hmm. That despite all of these these issues that he addresses, he he ends on a note of hope, where simultaneously, during that same period, you had some Black Americans who were not hopeful and made a decision to return to Africa and ended up establishing uh, the country of Liberia. Right. Yeah. So so you you, you have this tension even within the, the black community about do we stay here or do we leave? Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I think I'm getting the, getting the hook now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but if anyone would like to continue talking after we let you guys go, I'm glad to do that. Um, I'll be around for a little while. But th again, thank you so much for coming to so this <laughs>
It promotes vice, it shelters crime, it is a curse to the earth that supports it, and yet you cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. Oh, be warned. Be warned. The horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. But the love of God, tear away and fling from you the hideous monster, and let the weight of 20 millions crush and destroy it forever. But it is answered in a reply to all of this, that precisely what I have now denounced is in fact guaranteed and sanctioned by the Constitution of the United States. That the right to hold and to hunt slaves is a part of the Constitution framed by the illustrious fathers of this republic. Then I dare to affirm, notwithstanding all I have said about your fathers before, basically soon. And instead of being honest men, I have before declared them to be, they were the veriest impostors that have ever practiced on mankind. This is the inevitable conclusion, and from it there is no escape. But I differ from those who charge this basis on the frames of the Constitution of the United States. It is a slander upon their memory, at least so I believe. There is not a time now to argue the constitutional question at length, nor have I the ability to discuss it as it ought to be discussed. But in that document, I hold there is neither warrant, license, nor sanction of the hateful thing, but interpreted as it ought to be interpreted. The Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Read its preamble. Consider its purposes. Is slavery among them? Is it at the gateway? Or is it in the temple? It is not. While well, I do not intend to argue this question on the present occasion, let me ask if it be not somewhat singular that the Constitution were intended by its framers and adopters a slaveholding instrument. Why neither slavery, slaveholding, nor slave can be found anywhere in it. What would be the thought of a document drawn up, legally drawn up, for the purpose of entitling the city of Rochester to a tract of land in which no mention of land was made? Now, there are certain rules of interpretation for the proper understanding of all legal instruments. These rules are well established. They are plain, common sense rules, such as you and I and all of us can understand and apply without having passed years of the study of law. Now, take the Constitution according to its plain reading. And I defy the presentation of a single pro-slavery cause in it. On the other hand, it will be found to contain principles and purposes entirely hostile to the existence of slavery. I have detained my audience entirely too long already. At some future period, I will gladly avail myself of an opportunity to give this subject a full and fair discussion. Allow me to say, in conclusion, notwithstanding the dark picture that I have this day presented of the state of this nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work for the downfall of slavery. The arm of the Lord is not shortened and the doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began, with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. Nations do not now stand in the same relation to each other that they did ages ago. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. The time has passed when such could be done. Long established customs of hurtful character could formally fence themselves in and do their evil work with social impunity. Knowledge was then confined and enjoyed by the privileged few, and the multitude walked out in mental darkness. But a change has come now over the affairs of man. Walled cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has worn away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathway over and under the sea, as well as on the earth. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on the other. The far off and almost fabulous Pacific rolls in grandeur at our feet. The celestial empire, the mystery of ages is being solved. The fiat of the arm almighty. Let there be light has not yet spent its force. No abuse, no outrage, whether in taste, sport, or avarice, can now hide itself in the all-pervading light. In the fervent aspirations of William Lord Garrison, I say, Godspeed the year of Jubilee, the wide world over when from their galling chains set free, the oppressed shall vilely bend the knee. 
Until that year, day, hour arrived, with head and heart and hand all strive, to break the rod and rend the God, the spoiler of his prey to rod. So witness heaven, and never from my chosen post, whatever the peril or the cost, be driven. Thank you. For the most part, I think it was really well received. 
And there were not yet the abolitionists in the room, yeah, mostly. There were, so there were people who agreed with him. To absolutely. Anyway. There were a lot. There were a lot of them. They must have realized by then that the so-called independence and freedom was only for white male landowners. Right. So that was it. Right. Was it published in the paper? I don't think so. Because uh, it was. I, the, the speech is very cut down. What I what I delivered here today. The speech when you time it. Uh, full length of the speech, it was over two hours long. So if you publish that in the paper, you're, that is the paper. <laughs> we have a question back here. Yeah, um, aside from memorizing the speech itself, how did you prepare? What did, what did you look at? How did you, what, what did you look at as far as Frederick Douglass' life? How did you prepare for the role? I walked around in my apartment in the suit a lot. <laughs> um, but I read, I read a lot of uh, his personal writings. He's got three autobiographies. Um, there's also a book called The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass that was written in 1891, which he would have been around to give input on that book. So I use that as a really important source. And then I have, you know, I have a really strong network of uh, friends in the historical community that I reached out to and was like, hey, if I want Tim to send it to me, if you find this, you know, let me know. Um, there's, a, there's an author named Cody Neesh um, who does some excellent research on Frederick Douglass, and I, I lean on him a lot. Um, like higher wise, uh, do you have to look for something that was period or something that based upon the pictures that uh, that uh, of Leonard Patrick Douglas that what he was wearing and things like that to be more? I based it on a picture from uh, 1855, so it would have been three years or so after the speech, and I figured his facial hair would be similar and all that. Um, but in that picture, he's actually he's wearing a darker uh, dark coat, but he would have very over time, of course. Um, so style wise, style wise, style-wise, this is about this is what he would look like in that period, eighteen fifties. While he was in Rochester at that time, um, do you know if he met with some of the suffragettes? I'm pretty sure he did, um, because he was really heavily involved in the um, women's suffrage movement post Civil War. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure he was making those connections. If I'm not mistaken, the speech was given on the 5th. Was that done deliberately, that he didn't want to perform the speech on the 4th, or was the event for the 5th? I think it was just the timing. Uh, it was just delivered on the 5th because, you know, think about it, everybody celebrating on the 4th, and then they got to wind down a little bit on the 5th and come in and have this conversation. So. More questions? I like the questions. I like the talk. <laughs> <laughs> Are you excited to be able to play your hair again? I think we're going to break it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have one more right here. Now, what was the, I guess, what was the heart of the event? Like, what was the main purpose of the event? Was it for him to speak, or was it? It was a celebration of the fort. Um, but they brought him in as a speaker because, you know, at that time, Rochester was very liberal. So they were like, yeah, let's bring in Freddie Cummins because he's an excellent speaker. Um, and then they got this in their lives. <laughs> for me is the timeliness, um, that the speech is really iconic, I think, because it was delivered in 1852, and here we are, 2019, and some of the themes that he addressed in 1852 are so relevant and so timely for today. So it's, it's really a classic speech. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed, um, you know, whenever I was uh, working my way through it, it's like I'm reading the news and then I'm working on the speech and I'm like, yeah. I'm really looking at something different. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, felt, it felt really mm -hmm. uh, poignant, especially when he talked about the fugitive slave laws. Because it doesn't feel different than what you're looking at with a lot of the immigration policy today. Mm -hmm. um, and you start looking at it and go, after all this time, how far have we actually right. traveled? Exactly. <clears throat> um, and that's why I felt like it was really important to, to give the speech and have this conversation because and We're still talking. hypocrisy in churches right. and religion. Right. And it's the same all over. Right. And then at the same time, there's still that optimism. Because you know, you've got mm -hmm. people, we're, we're all obviously aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, we're all obviously doing something to make a difference. So there's still, like you said, you know, there's still that optimism <coughs> about it. There's still people out there that want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And so. you should start with all of them that. Yeah. Giving yeah. all the yeah. education. <laughs> and so we still stay dumb enough to believe in, in religion like that. Amen. Um, I believe in Jesus Christ and always will. So you, you can do great parts of the I think everybody, you know, everybody kind of has that. Have your own sights. Yeah. 
So will you be giving this speech yes. elsewhere anytime soon? I sure hope so. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'd you like to be all over the place. Yeah, I'd like to continue uh, uh, going out and performing and giving really more than just this talk. I'd like to do a couple of these different uh, speeches because they're all relevant. So, yeah. one more question. So, Joel, would you being Frederick Douglass right now, giving this speech, what is your charge to people once they hear this speech? What do you want people to walk away with? Given that the things that are said in this speech are so relevant, do something. <laughs> you, know, um, you, you know what's happening. You know that there are opportunities for you to do something about it. So go do something. I think that's that's what he would have said. Um, and that was the reason he gave the speech is to say, hey, like wake up. You know, we we have an opportunity right now to go out and and be in this community and be out in the world and do something different. Because we can't, you know, stand here today and say, oh, well, you know, this is the 4th of July, everyone's free, when well, we know everyone's not free. Oh, so, great. You know, so, do something. That's what you're going to decide, you know, to uh, do the change. Yes, ma'am? I love the fact that he ends uh, on a note of hope. Mm -hmm. That despite all of these, these issues that he addresses, he, he ends on a note of hope where simultaneously during that same period you had some black Americans who were not hopeful and made a decision to return to Africa and ended up establishing uh, the country of Liberia. Right. Yeah, so, so you, you have this tension even within the, the black community about do we stay here or do we leave? Right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I think I'm getting the, getting the hook now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but if anyone would like to continue talking after we let you guys go, I'm glad to do that. Um, I'll be around for a little while. But th again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.